Each week, we have an in-depth conversation with one of the key players in the legislative process. This week, we welcome Representative Zakia Summers, a Democrat who represents House District 68, which includes parts of Hines and Rankin counties. She was elected to her second term last November. Representative Summers, welcome to At Issue. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, of course. Um, I'd like to start, you know, with the area you represent um, and some of the things that we've seen happen in the legislature over the last few years uh, regarding the Jackson's water system. So, um, you know, last year legislation popped up in the, uh, at the Capitol that would remove some of the autonomy um, over Jackson's water system. We're seeing the same thing that the House is about to get a bill from the Senate um, that would do much of the same, um, give the city some appointees over a board, but also give state officials appointees on a board that governs Jackson water system. So as a representative of that area, um, how do you respond uh, to legislative efforts to uh, take away some of that autonomy? Well, I, I, first of all, I think it's a bad bill. And, and I hope that the leadership in the House won't allow it to see any light at all. Um, what's interesting to me is, you know, the city of Jackson has been dealing with this water crisis. This is not a new issue. We've been dealing with this for years. And so many of us that represent the city of Jackson have requested help from the state over a number of years. I remember at the height of the water crisis, I think in 2021, mm-hmm. uh, the mayor Um, And the engineer at that time told us that we needed about $47 million to do some repairs on the system. And we were uh, under the impression that we were going to get the funding if it was administered through DFA. And what we ended up getting was only $3 million. And so the state state has been in a position to be able to help the city's uh, water walls, for, for quite some time. Now that, and thanks to the, the Biden administration, Congressman Thompson and, and, and others that supported this legislation that gave us funding to finally fix the system, now that we have federal funding that can fix the system with a third party manager and it's on the up and up, now all of a sudden the state wants to come in and say, but after it gets fixed, we'll take it, we'll take it from here. Um, I, I can appreciate the state you know, at this point in time, whether it's timely or not, um, wanting to come in and be of help. But I don't think that this is the right direction in order to provide that help. Right, so uh, two things then. What um, What is the right direction for that help? And you mentioned the third party administrator. What's your assessment of, of Ted Hennepin, the third party administrator? I think Ted has been doing um, a yeoman's job of of working to try to fix the system. Um, I think he probably did realize it was as as bad as it was, particularly with some of the billing issues, et cetera. Uh, But I think that he's been doing the very best that he can, bringing in expertise and other resources from outside the state to help us with our system. I was, however, a bit bit disappointed that he came out uh, so urgently in support of the legislation Mm -hmm without first conferring with the delegation and even with the city. I would have hoped that the the sponsor of the bill and Ted himself um, would have at least given us an opportunity to discuss it before um, it it made it through the process. But, you know, here here we are. You know, I, um, I, I am not all opposed to the state wanting to have some kind of stake in in helping us with our system. But what I would like to see is that the city can still uh, maintain its ownership of the system um, and that um, the, the state provides resources that will help to fully repair the system instead of creating a I, I believe it's called a corporate nonprofit that essentially will take take the system once it has been repaired. I, I think that we should allow what the federal court order has laid out to play out all the way through and let the judge decide uh, what needs to happen with the system after um, after Ted's time um, is has expired. Okay, um, mentioned this was this was a Senate bill that's coming over to the House, and you're saying that you hope leadership um, doesn't even let it really reach anything. Um, and that brings me to the question about about leadership. Uh, last year, there were uh, bills that kind of targeted uh, or at least focused on Jackson. Um, mm-hmm. 
and and uh, just like the water bill, I, mean, I think about HB 1020, the, the the expansion of the CCID, the creation of a court within Hines County, mm-hmm. uh, that started in the House. Um, that was under Speaker Philip Gunn. Are you seeing any differences uh, from leadership right now when it comes to engaging the the Hines County and the Jackson delegation uh, about solutions uh, that that you want to see rather than uh, solutions that you know, other members just want to bring uh, to 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 the committee and to the floor? So many differences. Okay. Uh, the the energy, the vibe in the house is totally different than what it was during my first term. Uh, Speaker Jason White has come in and really ushered in uh, a spirit of cooperation and bipartisanship that was not my experience um, during the 2020-2024 term, 2020-2023 term. Um, and, and And I really appreciate it because, you know, during my first term, we kind of operated under a leadership that was against working with Democrats, you know, not wanting to pass bills that had Democratic authors on there, you know, and not even allowing us to come to the table to talk about and debate uh, legislation. And so we're, we're seeing something totally different from that. And I think, you know, there's no better example of that than with Medicaid expansion. Uh, Speaker White and I last night received awards from the Community Health Centers Association of Mississippi. Mm. And um, in his acceptance speech, what he said was that we no longer want to be the party of no. We want to be the party where we can at least have a conversation about it and see what we can do. And I think the citizens of the state of Mississippi want to see that. They want to see uh, us working together because the, the best ideas come from when we work together. And what we've been able to do so far in the House, you know, it, it hasn't all been uh, hunky door, <laughs> right. you know, kumbaya. We have our heels and But valleys. relatively speaking. But, but relatively speaking, it's been much more positive. And, and the fact that we were able to get Medicaid expansion through after a decade of talking about it um, and Democrats really, you know, shouting from the hills about why we need Medicaid expansion. We're finally getting some attention to it and we pass it out of the house. Yeah. So I'd like to, that was a bipartisan, um, bipartisan vote, uh, done with, with really with no, no debate on the floor. Uh, I know a lot went on behind the scenes and in committee between the caucuses. Um, and by the time it got to the floor, it, it flew through. So what, I mean, kind of ex- elaborate on some of that. Um, you know, you, um, work, working, working with the speaker, working with chairman, uh, Medicaid chairman, Missy McGee. Um, how, I mean, uh, from a, to, to, for the chamber to go from a place where expansion couldn't even be talked about to having a bill on the floor long before deadline with bipartisan support that didn't have any debate, like how did that, how, how did that metamorphosis happen? You know, honestly, it starts with leadership. You know, if, if the leadership is on board with making something happen, it will happen. But if the leadership is opposed to even talking about it, then it's not going to happen. And so I think, you know, to, to the speaker's credit, he he made it happen. And as a result of that, we have a really good piece of legislation that I hope the Senate will pass. Um, but, but I also add that, you know, Brandon Presley's gubernatorial campaign really put Medicaid expansion as a top issue for the state of Mississippi. And I think through the work of the Democratic Party and Democrats across the state talking about this issue and raising uh, the point that our hospitals are on the brink of closure. We have uh, individuals who are working but are caught up in a gap and they're sick. They're dying. Um, We receive reports and stats from the health department to show just how bad our disparities are in the state of Mississippi. And so I think that the speaker um, took all of that into context and he has worked with uh, Chairwoman uh, McGee to get to get a bill uh, across the the finish line in the House that Republicans can live with, mm-hmm. because we know that with any piece of legislation, you got to have the political feasibil- right. feasibility necessary for it to go anywhere. And, and to that point, I mean, this this is a bill that you know uh, that that the Democrats have asked for expansion, but this is not the this is not the 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 perfect bill for the Democrats either, right? Correct. And I mean, there there really is no perfect bill, no matter how you know. And and we we get a lot of uh, pressure from outside 
uh, folks, advocacy organizations, et cetera, that, you know, they, they want the whole elephant, but this process is, is an incremental process. We just, it just doesn't work like that. Um, you know, the Democrats also put forward a, a plan as well early on. Um, and we thought that the, the proposal that we put on the table was something that Republicans could also, um, you know, a, a, attach to. And we, we made it that way because we wanted it to have some kind of life. Now, of course, the Medicaid expansion bill that we passed is, has, is nothing like the proposal that we put on the table, but I think it still um, provides a solution to the health care issue. I know the work requirement uh, piece of the bill is, you know, maybe uh, an issue for some folks. But for us, at least in the House Democratic Caucus, we just decided that that wasn't going to be a sticking point that would force us to vote against the bill when we know there are so many people across the state that need access to care. And to that point, uh, there is uh, there is language in the bill that if CMS, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare, uh, denied the, the, the waiver for a work requirement, the bill will live on. Correct, correct. And I think that's I think that's the right language because we've seen, you know, states that have submitted their proposal um, and, and they have not been approved with the workforce requirement. I think maybe only one state has been approved. And so what we're saying is, sure, we, we will provide a, a workforce requirement um, in, in a work requirement in this bill um, because people should should work in order to get to get this uh, this assistance. But just in case, mm -hmm. and there's always, you know, a good thing, I think, to have a just in case it doesn't get approved, then we still can move forward with making sure that people have insurance. And and the governor said something during his state of the state speech that has, has stayed with me mm -hmm. since he said it. He mentioned three things that Mississippi should be doing to help our citizens. He said we should be helping Mississippians achieve wealth, prosperity, and longevity. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> if we are going to accomplish that, and I'm right there with you, Governor Reeves, and I and I and I believe that Governor Reeves, when he receives the Medicaid expansion bill, that's hopefully the House bill, he will sign it. I, I know he's talking a lot. I mm -hmm. know he's talking a lot, but Governor Reeves. Is, is a Christian just as I am. And scripture says that if you love Jesus, you feed the people. Now, that's what it says. Mm -hmm. So I believe that Governor Reeves is going to do the right thing. And if we are to achieve that mantra of wealth, prosperity, and longevity, we got to make sure people are well. To that point of, of Governor Reeves, I mean, is this, they, they passed, um, this bill passed the House with, with, with the necessary two-thirds, you know, supermajority to override a veto is the spirit in the house and, and there to if, if the governor were to to if this were to get through to his desk and veto it that that is the spirit there to override that veto oh no absolutely no doubt about it i mean we we are ready the question is do we have it in the senate and i and i'm yeah. not sure that we do um but we but we're going to continue to work with our with our partners over in the other chamber and you know try to solidify that you yeah. know, because because as I said, just in case, you always need a, a, a just yeah. in case. Yeah, and to that point, they, <laughs> they did not pass anything themselves. Uh, they right. have opted to take up your bill in committee, uh, which um, all indications means it's going to lead to conference. Correct. Um, you know, do you have any desire or ambition to be a conferee on that, if, if asked? Um, I I. I would love to, but I think the rules state that you have to be on the committee. Yeah, you're not, and you're not, and I'm okay. not on the committee. You co-authored the you um you co-authored the presumptive eligibility. Did you? I did. I co-authored okay. presumptive eligibility, and I signed on the Medicaid expansion as well. Um, and presumptive eligibility, you know, we passed that very early on yeah. in the session, and it and it passed with flying colors. I'm not sure if the governor has signed it yet. I know it's on his desk if he mm -hmm. hasn't signed it yet. And that was again through the leadership of Chairwoman McGee um, and Speaker White. Chairwoman McGee, man, she's She's been killing it in Medicaid. Um, you know, I, during my first term, we, we didn't do much in Medicaid mm -hmm. but besides pass the technical uh, bill that we pass every, every four year, years. Yeah. Uh, but what presumptive eligibility would do is presume that a woman is eligible for Medicaid so that she can go to the doctor early on. And, and hope the goal, hopefully, is that we can prevent, um, you know, maternal mortality, infant mortality. The rates are 
are ridiculous in the state of Mississippi, particularly for black women. Mm -hmm. um, black women are dying at disproportionate rates because of uh, a, a, a pregnant a condition that's associated with pregnancy. And so, you know, we just believe that if if, a, if we can get a woman into the doctor to start that health care early on, that she has a better chance of survival and having a healthy child. Um, pivoting a little bit, um, you are a, a, a have been, since your time in the legislature have been uh, a big advocate of of examining and 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 um, expand in a way expanding voting rights, really looking at voting rights in Mississippi. Um, first, I'd like to talk with what you've done in the House. Um, the House has passed uh, legislation that would uh, re-enfranchise um, some you know, some convicted felons on the that 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 have been convicted of the one of what twenty two I think right now um, disenfranchising crimes. Um, and it, as someone who has has fought for uh, voting rights and 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 making sure that the uh, the the electorate fairly represents uh, the the people of the state. Um, can you tell me what to see the House move on something like that, something that's been in litigation for for years? To see the House be more proactive and, and take a stance on that, what was that like? It was it was incredible. Um, my colleague, Representative Kabir Kareem from Lowndes County. Uh, authored this legislation and has been authoring it for the past eight years. This is his ninth year introducing this legislation. And we know that voting is the cornerstone to democracy, but there is a huge swath of people in the state of Mississippi that get those rights taken away once they've been convicted. Now, now of course, there is a process where they can be re-enfranchised, but it's a very difficult, cumbersome process. It includes getting, getting approval from the entire legislature. Correct. So you have to get two-thirds of both chambers to pass a suffrage bill in your name, which is not an easy thing to do. And it's, to be clear, it's, this is case by case, one, you know, one person at a time. Case by case. And, you know, last year I had five suffrage bills that, you know, I testified to the subcommittee in the House about, you know, how these individuals, you know, they serve their time, they don't have any restitution, they are now productive citizens in their community, went over to the Senate, passed the House, went over to the Senate, did the same thing, testified to the Senate committee, they passed all of them, and then the Senate didn't take them up on the calendar, so they died on the calendar. Okay. So effectively, all of, all of those individuals that we had done so much work for, um, they were not restored. And so what, what this bill would do, which is House Bill 1609, would re-enfranchise some individuals that have been convicted of nonviolent felonies. Uh, we have 22 disenfranchising crimes. The, the, the bill also was amended to include or to add two additional crimes, uh, sexual battery and human trafficking, which is not currently in the Constitution. Um, you know, the... You mentioned about the litigation. The the three judge panel did rule that that this disenfranchising um, disenfranchising voters was unconstitutional. But you know we know that this court has a tendency to to lean yeah. conservative, and so we don't know what's going to happen. Exactly, and and that, and that has been heard by the full court, but yeah. we have not gotten a decision from the full Fifth Circuit right. on that. Right. So this this piece of legislation is definitely proactive in nature to say that after five years of you finishing your your time, you can automatically be re-enfranchised. Now, we had another um, very important piece in this legislation that was taken out, which was around um, expungement. Mm -hmm. But um, the uh, Representative Kareem and others, we, we just decided that we could live with that because, you know, some some progress is better than no progress. And it will continue to work to see how we can get expungement put back in um, at some point in time, you know, in, in future sessions. OK. And then coming from the Senate over to the House as a is a bill that would allow for a 15 day um, early voting period, which is uh, the mechanisms of which are different than absentee voting. This is actually, you know, it's 15 days of, of it'll according according to the legislation will look just like it would on on election day you'd have to go to your 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 circuit clerk but you'd get a ballot you'd fill it out you put it in a machine and it would automatically be counted on the day of on election day rather than sitting in an envelope you know like this in person absentee voting is so um you know 
yes, again, you know, someone who's championed voting rights and, and really examining Mississippi's voting laws and opening more up. How do you feel uh, about this? And do you think this is something the House has an appetite for? I, I'm thrilled about it. I believe that we do. Uh, the chairman of elections on the House side happens to be my desk mate, uh, Representative Noah Sanford. Um, he is taking a different approach and making sure that we increase access to the to the ballot box. Um, early voting has been, you know, a part of my priority list since I've been in in position. Uh, I'm also a former election commissioner, and so I understand the process of voting. But I also understand that having voting relegated to just one day on a Tuesday, when most folks are at work. Um, when moms have to go pick up the children and take them to soccer practice and those kinds of things, it actually limits uh, the the process. And so I, I, I'm i very excited that the Senate decided to take this up. Um, I'm looking forward to it coming over to the House, and I hope we can get it across the finish line. Okay. And then in, um, in education, um, uh, the, we, we saw this session um, the House present a completely – a modified uh, funding mechanism for education, the mm-hmm. Inspire Act. Um, uh, uh, it, it 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 was voted on. Um, shortly thereafter, some questions arose to how those numbers came to be. Uh, what I mean, what is your what is your take right now on um, on prime or K twelve education funding? Yeah. Um, and this new approach from from uh, Chairman Robertson and uh, his deputies, uh, Representatives McCarty and Owen. Yeah. Well, and, and your listeners know that we have only fully funded MAEP twice since its inception. There is no appetite to fully fund MAEP. And so what the what Chairman Roberson has done um, is put forward a new formula called Inspire. And um, there was some questions about the numbers, but it, it's my understanding that uh, the MAP numbers that were provided came directly from MDE, and the INSPIRE numbers were calculated based on the formula that's in the legislation. Okay. Uh, this f- new formula would actually provide, I believe, $200 million more to K-12 education, and I am totally for giving more money to K-12 education because they need it. And I supported the legislation. Now, with that being said, I wish, I hope, and I and I, I, I look forward to when we can ensure that we're providing reliable, sustainable, realistic funding for K-12. There's no provision in this legislation that says that Inspire will be fully funded year right. after year. Um, and it, it it lacks an objective formula. Is that is that a is, is, was that something? That you that you had to weigh on the MAP had this objective formula. Inspire does not have that objective formula. It, it, it then kind of kicks the the, the decision making to uh, a committee of of professionals. Um, how, how did you feel about that change? I, it 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 was a little unsettling for me um, because it states that the legislature can come back and change that uh, student base cost, um, but. After hearing uh, Representative Kent McCarty, who I believe is also a co-author on Mm -hmm. this legislation, talk about it when he presented the bill, um, he said that those numbers will be advised by our legislative budget office, which I which I trust, um, and that there was no appetite or intent to decrease it by any means. If anything, it would be increased. Um, And so. You know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. The Senate has another uh, bill that makes some tweaks to MAP. Mm-hmm. You know, it's likely these these pieces of uh, legislation will likely go to conference. Right. We'll see what bears out. But I but I support more funding for education, and and I also would like it to be sustainable. Okay. Well, I've I've driven this conversation so far. We've talked about a number of issues, but I, I do want to kind of leave the floor open to you right now to to the pieces of legislation or issues. Um, that you know, we just kind of we're, we're hitting. By the time this airs, um, we will have hit the, uh, the 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 deadline for general bills. Um, but what I mean, what is top of mind for you um, as we work through the rest of the session? Yeah, well, you know, we're about to. Um, it's it's halftime now, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So we're about to receive um, a lot of the Senate, all the Senate bills, and we'll see how they're referred through committee. Uh, I do sit on drug policy, county affairs, tourism. Workforce Development and Technology. 
Um, I'm really interested to see what we do with tourism. Tourism has been a money, huge money generator for the state of Mississippi. Uh, we do have uh, new leadership in the in the chairman seats for for that for that committee, and so I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what the Senate will send over to us for us to bear out. Um, and I I think so far session has been, for the most part, has been really positive. You know. Um, you you never know what the Senate is doing. I don't. We really don't have time to, um, you know, watch the Senate proceedings. Sometimes I have an opportunity to watch the YouTube just just to see what they're talking about. And so you know, we'll see we'll see what they bring over. Okay. All right. Um, well, I want that's one, one. This came just came up. I thought about it. I mean, I know that our neighboring states. Um, cause I believe this is something, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe this is something you also been, um, been vocal about, been outspoken about. Uh, we have neighboring states that have adopted their own crown acts. Um, but I've noticed that, uh, I've noticed that Mississippi, um, you know, legislators have, have filed the bill. It, it died in committee. Um, you know, do, do you think there's a time where you know, the, the, the legislature will have an appetite to take up something like that? I think that's a great question. Um, based on what happened Yesterday, I, I'm not sure. Uh, we had a piece of legislation to establish the Mississippi Women's Bill of Rights, mm-hmm. which was really just a vehicle to marginalize the trans community. Um, but I wanted to take advantage of it since it was it was on the calendar. Yeah, I made an amendment um, for to to include. Uh, language from the Crown Act that said that no school, school district, or school administrator could expel or discipline a student because of their hair. Um, this this is an issue, you know, for for us because we have, you know, particularly for, for black children, children of color, um, who cannot control the way that their hair is grown. We don't want them to be denied any opportunity because of that. And so, you know, I, I just find it interesting that we, we go so far to protect some people, mm-hmm. <laughs> but we won't, we won't continue that that theme uh you know when it comes to when it comes to black people to be honest with you and i and i think that if if it's what my my colleague representative Pine says if it's good for the goose it's good for the gander um we we need to take it the entire way and as you said, there are, I believe, 24 states that have enacted the Crown Act. Protecting hair does not hurt anyone. It only affirms a student and tells them that they are fine just the way that they are and that they have the opportunity to go to school and not be disciplined because of the way that they wear their hair. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, any kind of outrageous. What I'm talking about is natural hairstyles, protective hairstyles. Um, and, you know, it, it, back in the day before my time, you know, folks were wearing afros all the time, and, and that was just the thing. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if a, if, a, if a child wants to wear afro, if he wants to wear braids, or if she wants to wear locks, or if she wants to wear her hair like mine, which, mm-hmm. is, which is naturally curly, that should be okay. And um, I was a little disappointed that the House uh, decided not to support that amendment. But, you know, we'll, we'll keep trying. Okay. All right. Well, Representative Zakia Summers, thank you so much for taking some time to speak with us on that issue. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Okay.